I was thinking about uh, what I wanted to talk to you about when Rosenthal so um, graciously asked me to come and speak to you. And I, was, I, and I kept on circling around the idea of God so much has changed and what shall I talk about and how shall I encapsulate all these different things that have changed over, say, the last year and a half or two. Um, and so I thought I would just try to articulate the change instead. So that's what I want to share. And this is a change within CNN Digital and uh, I think the industry at large. So it's going to hit a couple of things. Um, there, are, there are three main forces of play that came to mind when I started to think about these changes that we've been going through uh, at CNN Digitally and elsewhere in the industry. Uh, one was all things Trump. Uh, two were a large collection, if you, if you can even attempt the mental exercise of putting aside all things Trump and think about some of the other things that have happened in the last year or two, um, the Me Too movement, uh, stories about race and justice and lack thereof, uh, stories about uh, violence and acts of terror, uh, including uh, the Vegas mass shooting, uh, you think about three hurricanes. You think about the refugee crisis. You think about climate. Um, there's a, it, it just feels like the news cycle has uh, exploded upon itself in the last uh, year or two. Uh, and then, of course, you put all things uh, happening in and around the White House on top of that, and it's, and it's quite a time. And then you think about just the turmoil within the industry. Um, everything that's happening these days with the so-called duopoly. Uh, our head of sales the other day, Christine, <laughs> talked about how it's not a duopoly uh, from her point of view. It's a triopoly with you when you put Amazon in the mix. Um, the ad model for digital, as we all know, has been, it's been a wild ride, and it's, and it's been a, a challenge all along, so it's not like that's anything new, uh, but it just feels like there's another new level of challenges to that right now. Um, so there's just a lot that's happening, um, a, lot of, a lot of forces at play. So that leads me to articulate nine things, and I'll go through them pretty quickly because what I really want to do is talk to Kathleen because I've known her for a long time, um, and I adore her. Um, so um, so the, one of the big changes that's been super refreshing, and this is going to be a theme throughout this, is really getting back to some of the fundamentals of journalism. Um, what does it mean? How do we cover breaking and developing news? How do we think about doing better at investigative work? What does it mean to investigate something? What are we investigating it? What kinds of people do we need to have those skill sets to dig? What kinds of beats and beat expertise do we need? How do we, how do we say what's, what's true and what's false? And how do we reality check things? And how are we doing in terms of just doing a good job of letting our audiences know when we get something wrong, or if we need to change something, how we've changed it. And a lot of those things that I just rattled off could be things that could be talked about at a version of ISOJ in the 80s or the 70s or the 60s or something. Um, but they're, they're, they're absolutely fundamentally important. Um, and that last quote was just something that it's just every day there's something like something said in a news meeting. I just pulled it from a news meeting the other day and I wanted to pop it in here. You know, people are saying things like, we need a rigorous adherence to the truth. These are, th this is the language that's being used these days. Um, the second big change is that over the last couple of years with all these forces at play, we've really worked to crystallize our journalistic proposition. So at CNN, uh, video is in the DNA of CNN. That's, that's what we what we were and are at our core, breaking news 24-7, uh, relentlessly. Sorry for all the alerts. Uh, and uh, ubiquity everywhere we can possibly be around the globe. And again, we talk about these things in our news meetings, uh, in just daily conversations, in all of our communications every day. We try to tie it to every act of journalism or often uh, acts of business or building products or what, it, what uh, or whatnot. The other big change uh, at CNN Digital in the last, and again I would argue beyond, in the last year or two has been this introspection on on some some real uh, 
basic yet existential questions. Uh, are we as journalists in our own filter bubble? Of course we are. What does that mean for each of us as individuals? How aware of that are we? How do we work to get out of it? When do we call something a lie? Can we call this a lie? Uh, we've been tested on that in new ways. Do we call someone a liar? Um, can we use the term fake news? Or no, are we just reinforcing that idea if we use that term? Uh, are we being transparent enough with what is just straight up news, just the facts, ma'am, versus when we're getting into analysis and showing our expertise, our opinion? Do audiences understand that? Is a label enough? Um, and, and what are the stories in a time like this, when we're focused so much on Trump and politics, and uh, rightly so, at CNN and collectively uh, for news organizations around the world, what are the things that we're not looking at? It's our job to, to, to make sure we're casting a broad gaze and not, and not miss the things that are so key and so critical. So this is a slide that I show sometimes that talks like this. We, we call it our bubble chart. It is how we think about uh, where we are for our audiences. So on the very outer band is emerging and off-platform, right? Things like Apple News, Amazon, text is a little squishy in those bubbles, I apologize for that. Then you go down and you get to social and messaging apps, right, Line, Kick. We used to have Snapchat on this bubble chart. We're not on Snapchat anymore, so we took that off. I hope it's off, yes, it's off. <laughs> uh, video platforms, Roku, et cetera. And then the beating red heart is the core of the owned and operated platforms. And I used to talk about this, I, I used to use this slide to kind of illustrate like boom, that whole thing that we talk about, about we need to be where our audiences are. And that is true, That's, that remains true. But, but what's interesting in the last year or less, this chart now means something different to me. That beating red heart at the center is what we control and it's what we own and it's where our audiences come to us. And it is our house and our brand, and it is where we make the most money, and it is where we have the most control over our destiny. So it's not just about being everywhere your audiences are in whatever platform you can be on in, in every form and every format everywhere. It's about making sure that you can, you can have a strong core, right? Uh, which leads to point number five, it overlaps. I feel like there was a while, a year or two ago, where the term destination site was kind of said pejoratively. You just, you don't wanna be an old like destination site. Like that's, how lame is that? But how wrong is that, <laughs> right? I mean, if you're a destination, what are the destinations these days? Facebook? A, a strong homepage, which CNN.com still has, it's one of the most powerful pages on news on the internet, on mobile and desktop. A strong homepage is a proxy for the strength of your brand, for the trust that your audiences have in you. And you should never consider that some kind of like old thing, oh, we gotta stop the homepage is some like outdated thing. No, it's, it's so valuable. Um, yeah, so, uh, this is another point, and, and Kathleen and I talked about this a little bit. Um, I, I'm an old web person, as she said, um, more diplomatically than that, but I've been doing this since the mid-90s. And when I was at the New York Times, it was very, it was just very separate. You know, the web people were, were physically in another location on one side of Times Square than the newspaper, and the communication in the beginning was just not that the, 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 what number do I call again? I mean, it just wasn't really there. So um, over time, there became to be, there, there were lots of conversations around integration, right, between print and web. You can talk about this with, with TV and, and web and digital and all of that too. And integration, to hear it with digital ears, was, um, was not a good feeling. It meant that 
the most likely outcome was that digital experts were going to lose autonomy, power, and, deci and decision-making ability to people who were not digital experts. That's what integration meant, right? I see some of you nodding, right? Are you mind snapping? Um, so that, that whole argument feels like it went away and it dried up for me, from my experience, maybe about four or five years ago. It's not the right framework. At CNN, if, if any of you were to listen, and some of you have been on these, on these calls, um, if any of you were to listen to our morning news meetings, you would hear us talk, the entire network, digital, all aspects of digital, and TV included, we start by talking about the stories of the day. What do we need to say about the Comey story today? Well, we clearly need to make sure that we, you know, have a piece that talks about the 9, 11, 12,000 of the most noteworthy revelations from the book. We need that. We also need to talk about Comey and his history. He's talking about setting a forest fire uh, to Trump. Well, he set a forest fire uh, to candidate Clinton not so long ago as well, right? So let's just remind audiences of the journey of where he's been, right? Just a couple of examples from the, from the call this morning, right? So you, talk, you start with the story and from there you get into, okay, what does that mean? Here's how we're gonna do that story uh, in text. Here's how we're gonna do that story uh, on Instagram stories. Here's how we're gonna do that story for Facebook in a variety of different ways on Facebook. Here's how we're gonna do that story in a chart or a graphic or a short video that we might use for one platform and a package on TV. And by the way, Anderson's gonna book this guest to explore this exact topic later on tonight. So I, that's the illustration of how integration, it's like you don't talk about it in integration anymore. You talk about what's the story, how do we get after it, and all the places that we need to get after it. And I, there was a screenshot on there of the Guns Town Hall that some of you might remember from many weeks ago. And that was another example of where we just came together as a network and said, a network, not TV network, just network, and said, uh, what are all the different ways that we can, we can cover this across every platform, pre-game, game on, and post-game. Uh, so that brings me to number seven. Uh, and some of you have hit this in the, in the previous talks that I've heard. There's like this uh, competitive sisterhood that's happening these days. It's happening, um, th this competition among news organizations is for the most part, in my opinion, a really strong and healthy thing. And I wanna crush NY Times on mobile weekend traffic right now. <laughs> um, but that, like, that's, that's great because it helps us figure out what to do better for our audiences and it makes the whole collective experience of global independent journalism even better. So that's good. Um, but I, I, I think I'm observing that more and more, especially around all things Trump, we're kind of playing off of each other and crediting, crediting each other more when someone breaks a story, someone else follows up on that, might, might dig a layer deeper, might cite that earlier story. And it's almost like we're banding together in a really interesting way. Um, and I just, I think it's a lovely thing. Um, and we are all also facing uh, the same challenges in many cases across the industry with the ad model, with the do or triopoly. Um, and so I just, it, it feels like there's a, there's a shared sense of what we're all after here, and it's a good thing. Uh, two things come first. This has been another thing that I feel like has been a change that we just, we talk about a lot, so I wanted to share this one. Um, it's just something that we've articulated. I, I suppose it's always been the case, but it's two things are number one. The story, what is it? How are we getting after it? Who are we getting, who are we getting on it? Audience does it serve, right? The story and the audience. Um, those are just some basic fundamentals. Who is this story serving and what is this story? It's not enough to say, okay, everyone, let's just go cover the Comey book. It needs precision and thoughtfulness. Which leads me to my last point, number nine, which is um, it, we, have, we have modified, as we all should, I think, over time, who and how we hire. Um, who and how we hire these days. We are looking for people 
with those fundamental skills, that it's not like they're old, it's that they are evergreen. People who know how to report, who know how to write, who know how to edit sharply, swiftly, people who understand lots of things about video, people who might have a certain expertise in a given platform, who really get Snapchat, who really get um, VR, or people who really might understand the refugee crisis in a deep way because they've covered it elsewhere, people who have an intense sense of curiosity and know what they don't know and can say it, and know how to ask good questions. I work really closely, I, our head of programming for CNN Digital, her name is Mitra Kalita, some of you guys know her, and she said something the other day and I was like, that is so damn good. She said, this is a business of details. We are in the business of details. The details are not, and I say this especially for the educators and the students, the details are not the, the drudge work. The details are the essential. The right word, the right language, the right image at the right time, on the right device, for articulated chosen audiences. This is the lifeblood of what we do. And then lastly, of course, for CNN, when we think about who we hire, sometimes there's people like, well, I'm not that big into breaking news. And it's like, I'm sorry, I got to go. <laughs> you have to have a love for what's happening in the moment, right? And I, and I think that extends outside of CNN. So those are my nine points. And now I really want to talk with Kathleen. Thank you. Um, oh, you know what you think? Oh, we can sit. Let's do it. Yes. And you can all hear me, right? Yeah. Thank you. Water, this conversation would be so much better with 19 crimes. It's an Australian wine. <laughs> <laughs> so I took really good notes, I hope. Um, and I'm not going to go in any particular order, but um, number six, integration is a red herring. For all the newsrooms that have combined you know, their digital operations under one person or under one desk, literally moving them into the same place. So you talked a little bit about that, you know, the, um, but a little bit more about what you saw happening when integration was the newsroom standard. I, it, it's, not, it's not that it's not still happening, right? Mm -hmm. It's happening. It's just that the meaning of it has changed and that it's no longer the primary thing that I feel like if you're a digital journalist working at a place that, has, that is not purely only strictly digital, that you always feel like you have to contend with in some way, right? So, I mean, think about it. When you and I were at the Times, we were... Um, I mean, we're very young now, but we were a little bit younger then. No. And we were, there weren't that many times when you and I came together, right? There were right. like some management meetings or something, like there were things like that, but it wasn't that, that the, the print side and the digital side were working together every day on the acts of journalism, right? And this is what I, something you said, that the digital expert would lose the power and the control. Yeah. And I, don't want to offend anybody at the times at that time, but I do, I think what you're getting at is that the traditional journalists felt as if they knew better. Right. Um, there's a sense that, oh, you've built this nice thing, now we're going to take over and we, we understand personnel. We understand That's right. news judgment and blah, blah, blah. And now you're saying at, at CNN and other places, and this includes the times, that, oh, this person really knows how we should be operating on this platform. That's right, that's right. I, and it's not that, I just, it, it's, it's something I wanted to share because it, it really has, it really has been a shift in my own thinking. And I, and I know from, from some of my colleagues and pals in the industry, it's evolved in this wonderful way where it's no longer about does someone have the, the digital skills. I mean, digital skills is such a broad term anyway. There are people who understand just within digital, you've got people who are experts on different social platforms, people who are experts at uh, different kinds of tools and technology or photography or visualizations or whatever. It's changed so quickly. So even within digital, there are people who don't get other aspects of digital. And how wonderful is that? 
that it's grown and exploded so much, right? So I think um, your example of people at the, at the times when we were there thinking they understood personnel and hiring and, and news judgment, I think all, they absolutely understood all of those things. But was it going to be, the, the, the thing that we were always nervous about back then was, oh, integration means there will be a ceiling placed on top of mm. the digital possibilities, right? That, mm. that the digital journalists might lose some, some power and control because they might need to spend some time explaining what a CMS is to uh, somebody, right? Or whatever it might be, right? Now, I, I think there might be some residual aspects of that out there, but I, I really feel like most journalists these days it's not a question of whether you're a TV journalist or a digital journalist, journalist or a print journalist. You should be just a modern journalist, mm. right? And, and some people are a little old school, and that's fine. And some people have a certain amount of maybe two or three skill sets, where others might have dozens of different skill sets. Um, but that's OK. Like, we are just at a point where things have gotten so big and so broad and the stakes so big that it's not a question of a power struggle between a legacy news organization and their digital arm. Mm. You know, I'm gonna follow that up with something I was just talking to, I'm not gonna say the person's name, someone very high up in media who's attending this conference, who, um, <laughs> that's all of you sitting out there, who was saying that one issue that he faces is that how do you grow your journalists? So we're talking about here's this person you've hired because a great videographer is doing stuff for CNN.com, International. More people watch CNN videos than any other. How does that person grow at a C in CNN? We just we spent so much time talking about this in um, my direct report meeting actually earlier this week. Um, I journalists have this weird thing sometimes where we get so focused on the all-important daily act of what stories we're doing, how we're doing it, how we're assigning it, how are we meeting the right metrics and the right goals, how are the audiences responding, what products are we building, that, that sometimes some of the things, some, some things around staffing and development That's what he get put in a at. corner. Yeah. And that is a horrible thing, right? So the most important thing that you can do if you're in any leadership position, any management or supervisory position anywhere, whether it's one person or a thousand, your job is to make sure that the people under you are growing and developing. That is the job. Um, it is the job. Like, it, that has to be 80% of what you're doing, right? So, um, and I, so yes. And I, I will characterize that he was talking about the whole idea of what positions can people go to in smaller organizations? Because if your boss is 33 and you're 22, you know, where maybe are you going? So I don't want to make it seem as if this, this it was a very intelligent conversation. And yeah, 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 no, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think the staffing and development thing, you know, who, um, are, what are the, it, it's a variety of things you can look at for a given person. One, where are they at on a scale? Are they someone who are, are they a rock star who is getting it and doing it and just need to grow and grow and grow? Are they someone who's, doing okay, or are they someone who really needs some help, right? And then from there, you create a plan. And you say, okay, this person, if they need some help, well, then they should spend some time with this person. They should make sure that they give very clear feedback about what the objectives of the job are, right? Um, if they're a rock star who's just killing it, like, of course, you can, you can promote those people out the wazoo, and you should, but you should also look at, um, ways to develop those people by going to conferences like this, uh, by getting some exposure to things that might be outside that person's filter bubble, by um, giving them new opportunities to work on different projects and assignments. It, it's actually not that difficult. It just requires some, some thoughtfulness and some structure about how you develop mm -hmm. staff, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things you had, and by the way, I want you guys to have questions. And I know you're putting stuff up on Twitter. Um, what and are I they can, saying about us? It's really hard. No debería tratarse de si eres periodista digital o periodista de prensa. Okay, yes. good. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I know my accent was horrible, but I went for it anyway. That was good. 
Um, another thing that you said is near and dear to my heart. Okay, so I am very old school. I take the New Yorker. I read it online, but I physically take it. And there's so many stories devoted to politics now that I miss the story about some obscure Polish author who's now influencing yeah. hip hop. Yeah. You know, there was always that New Yorker piece that 6,000 words. They did a piece on stink bugs. Yes. The stink bug piece was oh, awesome. Holy shit, it was so good. And part of me cocoons by reading those types of stories. So yes. the whole idea of what are we not covering if you could just talk a little bit more about that. God, I love that you cited the stink bug story. It's also like a nightmare, right? I mean, oh, it's horrible. Yeah. Um, but I enjoyed reading all 7,000 words of it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. It's riveting. Um, but it made you feel unsettled, just like maybe after reading politics stories. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, listen, it's just that, right? So. Um, the the heart the hardest part is the stink bug story, right? Because the the, the easier part is to say, we are not letting go of climate coverage. And we can do that and say that and mean that and keep it up. And we should. We are not letting go of uh, the refugee crisis story. We are not letting go of the Rohingya crisis. We are, we, are going, we are going in on that. We are dedicated to it. At CNN, we have amazing journalists around the world. We can and we should and we must do that. The stink bug story is a harder one. Mm -hmm. The stink bug story is, uh, and I have to check myself on this a lot these days, because one of the things that has changed, I didn't put this on there, I could have. One of the things that has, that has changed is we, we almost do, I'll say it this way, the bar for pure enterprise stories, mm -hmm. not investigative, not already attached to an existing vertical or beat. Doesn't save lives doesn't save lives, the ex the, right? It doesn't check all the boxes. The, the bar for those kinds of stories in the, in, in the news environment that we are in has gotten higher. So when, when I hear pitches, oh God, I hope I would have approved the stink bug story, right? <laughs> when I hear pitches for, for stories that aren't, don't have anything to do with the moment that we are living in, or the current news cycle, or some of our stated priority beats and objectives, it's hard for me to approve. Right? Mm. Stink bug story is a glorious example. So I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I think it just boils down to journalistic curiosity and questions that we should employ in our own newsrooms, not just with our subjects and sources, right? So that we, we should, well, what is that story? Why would that be good? Why would that be interesting? I mean, you know, you ask a few questions and I would think um, you could get to that and, and green light mm. that story. So really, if you, if you have questions, start, you know, come to the mic. And by the way, I have a couple more questions to ask her. If you have a question, do not make the lead-in very long. Do not clear your throat. You're very prescriptive. <laughs> yeah. you, don't, you, don't wanna, you don't want any grandstanding. Okay. Though, I mean, I used to say for the um, page one meetings, no performance art. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, how'd, how'd that work out? It didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with... People from all over the world reading your site, in people who, whose language, first language may not be English, and I know you're publishing in all these different languages and stuff, how do you make sure that you're capturing the culture of all of these places? How do you, how do you get inside so that the person who is from Malaysia can read the story and go, oh yeah, that's me, but the person from the US isn't putting the cultural baggage on it. I mean, do you think about those things? We think about it. it it's, it's a very good and hard question because we even think about it down to the, to the base level of, you know, part of my team is uh, run CNNI.com, right? And so we think about it with, okay, are we calling this story a football story or a soccer story when it's mm -hmm. the same ball, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, because that's how it works. That's um, how it works. So, uh, you know, we, we get down to that. Who, it, who are we talking to? Who is this story for? And the internet making it globally available as it does mm -hmm. makes it as accessible and available to everyone, which is great, but it means it might not end up in the right, in, in, the, in, the, in the hands of the intended audience. So the best thing you can do is to make sure that you, you identify, this is a story from CNN International. This is part of our football coverage, right? And, and just be clear about that. 
Um, but that's a small thing. That's like a, linguist, a, a linguistic thing. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think the best. I think the best stories. Language, like if someone doesn't read or speak or understand English to a high capacity, that gets a little trickier. But I think the best stories are universal and can be told and shared by who, and, and, and understood by whomever's reading them, right? Language comprehension kind of aside. I mean, it, you know, there's, um, I'm now gonna use your stink bug example, but there was a story ages ago that we used to cite that was like, Harper's had some story on beekeeping. So I, I mean, this is like two decades ago now or something. And we would cite that as, as what you're talking about with the stink bug story. Who knew I wanted to read 10,000 words on this topic? I never sought out to do that. It was like the ultimate in serendipity. Like you're fascinated by the story. But is this where videos? That's a part of that, right? But is this also where videos come in handy? Where if you have a global audience and totally. you have a global audience, that your use of video, you're saying video is something that we prioritize, helps build that global audience. Totally, absolutely, absolutely. Right, it stands for an article, it stands for a video. You're right, and video with a little bit of on-screen text, you, you know, if a picture tells a thousand words and a video does it exponentially, I don't know. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yes, the visuals of course always help, but it just really gets down to like those details and the, and the passion for telling the stories that need to be told with the right language, the right approach. The right platform. <laughs> the right platform, absolutely. I mean, you take one story, we, we have an exercise where you go through that bubble chart. You could take one story, and there are some that light up every single bubble, right? Mm. And, and look at the form and the format on each one of those bubbles, the audience that it reached, right? But it's the same story at its core. It is the story of the 11 most intriguing things from Comey's book, mm -hmm. right? But that, can, that, that needs to take different forms throughout uh, everywhere on, on all of our digital platforms. And TV, by the way, TV is just another screen. So uh, there's some people. Is there someone walking over there? Yep. Hey, uh, Katie Camp. I run digital for Cox Media Group in Orlando. Oh, great. Um, so my question to you would be, are there any conversations or any discussion going on at CNN right now concerned about the growing distrust in Facebook in relation to your brand? Absolutely. What are those conversations? I mean, you know. Um, Damn those people, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what are those conversations? Those conversations are, um, on the more introspective side, uh, Facebook has uh, gone perhaps from a platform that is that is that is something to be be held as a as a wonder of technology and audience interaction to oh they've got some issues too um, and we have to be keenly aware of that. Um, Facebook has gone from um, well this is always kind of it's always been this way. Uh, sometimes with CNN, and I assume you get this at Cox too, um, there might be certain things that we go in early with on Facebook, and there might be certain things that we don't want to go in early with on Facebook. It's our choice. It's our choice, right? Um, so we, we talk about that. We give that a little bit more rigor. Um, and we also know a lot of people at Facebook. A lot of the people... Doreen Mendoza, I won't mention any names, like used to work at CNN who are now at Facebook. And so you know these people, it's not, it's not the right technique to just say, never mind, we're not gonna talk to you anymore, we're gonna go away. It's what are we doing together? What are you doing to fix it? How can we help you fix it? Because there are some things that we need you to fix because it's good for us and our audiences too, right? So I would say that approach instead of just getting pissy about it and walking away, engaging and trying to solve the problem because it does impact us. And then the, the other thing I would say, which I've always said with Facebook and, and the other platforms, is 
just shame on anyone who puts too many of their eggs in the Facebook basket or, 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 or any other platform that they do not own and control. That's what I mean when I talk about that, that beating red heart of the, of the bubble chart that I showed you guys. We control, that is what we control and we own. So let's make that as good as it can possibly be and then make sure we go to where our audiences are with the right partners in the right ways, but not put our audience editorial and revenue strategy in the hands of someone who actually doesn't care, who actually, I won't say doesn't care, whose primary business is not our primary business, right? Okay, follow up then. Why'd y'all dump uh, Snapchat? We, we, uh, we decided to disengage, uh, no. <laughs> Uh, we, we dumped Snapchat because, um, because it was another one of those partnerships that were, um, I'm, I'm so glad we did it. We got a great set of uh, skills for journalists who, under, who were understanding how to work with uh, video images, sound, uh, motion graphics, like we, we learned all kinds of great things with Snapchat. You didn't lay off the person who knew about Snapchat, because earlier you were talking about expertise. Yeah. Oh, there's a person who knows Snapchat. That person is still with you. Are you talking about someone in particular? No, because you were in yes. general, yes. Yeah, so that's what we did. So when, so when we, as you say, dumped Snapchat, um, we just decided, like we were, we were going through the next round of how is this partnership going to look, look for us going forward. And we had a lot of good people who were, who were working on that platform. Uh, the revenue piece on the business side wasn't working out as much as we'd hoped. And we thought, wow, we could take a lot of those talented people and use them in other areas that get more to the, the beating heart of our core properties. So that was a decision we made. And by the way, I did not mean to, to stop people from asking questions. I apologize if I came across as that evil person. <laughs> Oh, so we are done? Oh. Well, I guess we were talking to each other that we didn't see the zeros or anything like that. So Meredith, this has been entertaining, but Thank it's you. also been so informative. And just, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Nine reasons why to keep, you know, following her career. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.